So, fourth grader, I'm going to be talking to you today about the Iowa Children's Choice Award. And this is an award that is, was set up by the Iowa Association of School Librarians 36 years ago. Now, there's other awards by this group for other age groups, but for you guys, it's the Iowa Children's Choice Award. And the cool thing about it is that it's for kids your age, for kids in grades 3 through 6 and just in the state of Iowa. It's for Iowa kids by Iowa kids. Now, this year there are 20 books on the list. I have read all of them, and I want to talk to you about them today. Now, how a book gets on the list to be nominated is that someone across the state says, hey, this is a really good book. I think others would like to read it. And so they take the information to their librarian, and it gets nominated to be on the list. All right. Well, we're going to get started, and my first book kind of starts with kind of a sad um, uh, theme, and it's about homelessness. And so the book starts out fairly happy. Sugar and her mom live in a house that Grandpa had left them. She's happy at school with her friends, and she adores her teacher. Her teacher recognizes that Sugar is a very good writer, and Mr. Bennett, the teacher, encourages her. And in fact, throughout the books, you're going to see things that uh, Sugar has written. The dad isn't really a part of the family, and that's okay, because he's kind of a deadbeat, and he's a gambler. I hate to say it. And it gets to the point where he has gambled away most of the family's money and they lose their house. They have to live with relatives, they have to go to a homeless shelter. Then mom, mom finds out that there may be work for her in Chicago, so they pack up their belongings, they leave Missouri, they head to Chicago, and along the way they adopt this a rescue dog by the name of Shush. Adorable dog, isn't it? Once they get to Chicago, though, Mom finds out the job situation is not what she was told it was to be, and Mom falls apart. She has something that we call a mental breakdown, and she ends up in the hospital. What's going to happen to Sugar and Shush? Well, they end up in a, a, a foster home, and it's kind of limited where they can go because Sugar won't leave Shush out on the streets of Chicago. Sugar wonders, will she ever be with her mom and Shush again in a house of their own, or will it always be just almost home? My next book, it's a little different, and you can tell from the cover, it's a little creepy. You're going to meet three characters by the name of Poppy, Zach, and Alice. And these kids have been friends for a very long time, and for years they have been playing a game, a fantasy game, where they have dolls and action figures who have lots of different adventures. And the one that rules over this <clears throat> fantasy land, they call the Evil Great Queen, who's a bone china doll who sits in a glass cabinet inside Poppy's house. But you know, the kids are getting older, they're getting ready for middle school, should they really be playing these games anymore? But Poppy's not quite ready to give it up. And so she tells her friends, I've been visited by a ghost, the ghost of Eleanor Kirshner. And Eleanor died with some mysterious circumstances. And she told me that the only way her spirit is going to rest is if we take the bone china doll and take it to the cemetery and bury the doll in Eleanor's empty grave. This is the picture of when she's telling them about this. And she said that Eleanor the ghost has told her, unless they help her out, she's going to make their life miserable. The other kids wonder, is there any, really any connection between this doll and the ghost? Or is it one of Poppy's story? Or is there something sinister going on? Kids decided that they're going to take the journey of a lifetime and try to get this doll to the cemetery. And all the way, there are a lot of creepy things that happen to them in doll bones. The infinity ring is very important because it allows people to travel back in time, which is good because things aren't quite right in our, our country right now. For example, there are only 48 states instead of 50. 
Our capital is Philadelphia, rather than Washington, D.C. And our country is being ruled by a very powerful group called the SQ. And the SQ has plans to take over the world. Now there's a group of people, a secret society, called the historians that are trying to keep that from happening. And listen, historians is spelled H-Y-S rather than H-I-S. And they have figured out that in time, back in time, there was something called the Great Breaks, where something in history got broken, and that's what changed the present for us. They decide that they're going to need the help of three kids. One is Zach. He's a genius who loves history. Then there is Sarah, who is also a genius, and she loves science. And Rick is a young uh, historian that's part of the secret society. They're going to use the infinity <coughs> ring to try to go back to change things. And their first adventure is going to be in 1492, and they go on a ship with Columbus, the Santa Maria. Now the reason they're there is because in, in their history books, it's the Marigo brothers who would have discovered America rather than Christopher Columbus. And they're going to see if they can stop a mutiny in time and get Christopher Columbus back in the history books. Now at the end of the book we find out that Dak, we find out where and when Dak's parents are. And by the way, they're the ones that invented the infinity ring. And you are invited to help them out. Because at the very front of the book, there's a secret door. And behind the secret door, you would find a poster. And this poster is going to help you play a game. The whole poster looks like this. It has information about the French Revolution on one side, a map of Paris on the other side, and you are invited to go to infinity.com, put in this secret code, and you can play the game to see what happens to Dak's parents. Now I think we here at Sagebro what we're going to do is laminate this so because if everybody's looking at this poster it's going to get, you know, ripped. So I think what we're going to do here at Sageville is laminate it, and Mrs. Butler is going to keep it. So after you read the book, you can talk to her about getting the poster, okay? And guess what? We do have other books on the Infinity Ring already in our library, so that's exciting. Okay. Do I have any football fans in here? No. Okay. This is written by a football player, but it's a baseball story. Okay, our story today is, is called Forced Out, and Tim Green used to be uh, play for the Atlanta Falcons. He's an NFL player. And I thought, why is he writing about baseball instead of football? But he does a very good job. Okay, there are two friends by the name of Zoe, Joey and Zach. Great friends. They do everything together, and the thing that they like to do best the thing that they're really good at is baseball. They're so good that it's almost a shoo-in that they are going to um, get on the all-star team. They just have to get through one more game, a championship game, and then they'll, it's almost a shoo-in that they'll be playing together. But one problem. Zach can't make it to the game. So Joey does something slightly illegal to make sure his best friend is going to get to play with him. Sure enough, they both do a wonderful job at the championship game. Their scouts are there. They're ready to go. And then they find out there's only a place for one of them on the all-star team. Who's it going to be? Which one of them is going to be forced out? And what's that going to do to their friendship? Okay, is the Tangle of Knots next? Okay. It's got kind of out of order here. Okay, The Tangle of Knots could almost be a realistic fiction book, except for the fact that almost everybody in this book has a talent. And when I say a talent, I mean talent with a capital T. Now, for example, one girl is really good at playing jacks. That's her talent. Another kid is really good at licking envelopes. That's his talent. And then there's this 
mysterious man in a brown coat who keeps showing up throughout the book. He has a smile that suggests he knows more about life than he's letting on, and his talent is tying knots. Now our main character's name is Katie, and she's an orphan. Her talent is baking cakes, and in fact, throughout the book, there are cake recipes that you can actually try out. Okay? Now, Katie, as I said, is an orphan, and she finds herself living above a very strange cult store called the Lost Luggage and Aquarium. And also living above the store is a family of three kids who are trying to learn more about their talents. There's Toby, who doesn't seem to have any talents at all, and then there's V, who doesn't talk. Hmm. Now the cool thing about this book is that every chapter <coughs> is told from the point of view from the various characters. So every chapter you're getting a different point of view. And I found myself predicting, how are these all going to fit together? What does one story have to do with the next? Well, I found out that they all came together like a big tangle of knots. And I was amazed at what, how they tied everything together. In fact, I had to go back and reread parts of it because I realized they had been dropping clues all the way through the book how everything was tied together like a tangle of knots. Great trouble in, uh, setting is very important. This is what we call a historical fiction book because it's based on something that really did happen. The year is way back in 1854, the place, London, England. And at that time, uh, something terrible happened. There was a disease called cholera. cholera that went through the, the neighborhood. Now I did a little bit of research and I found out that cholera is like having really, really bad diarrhea. But what's worse about it is that you get an infection in your intestines and it said that it could kill a healthy adult within hours. In this neighborhood in 1854, over 600 people died from uh, this epidemic. And they didn't know what was causing it. They thought there was poison in the air. But there was a man by the name of Dr. John Snow who had another idea about what was ca causing it. Now as I said, because this is historical fiction, this was a real person. And we have other pe pictures of other people who helped during this epidemic. Now the fictional character that you're going to meet, his name is Eel. And he's an orphan, and uh, what he does to earn money is he get, dives in the river, and he gets junk out of the river and, and salt, uh, sells the stuff to salvage yards to make <coughs> some money. Because Eel has a secret, and it costs him four shillings a week to keep this a secret. Then there's Fish Eye Bill, who's after him, and if he catches him, he's going to do nasty things to Eel. Eel finds out about Dr. Snow, and he wants to help him, help him solve the, the, the um, mystery of what's causing the blue death, as they call it. So it's kind of an exciting book, and also I learned a lot about London back in the 1800s, the Great Trouble. In the desperate adventure to Zeno and Alia, you're going to meet two characters. Alia is a little girl. She has a bad disease called leukemia. She's fighting it. She's winning, but she's very weak. And you know, when you have cancer, you sometimes lose your hair. And it makes, you know, her friends don't want to be around her because she looks so different and she's so tired all the time. So her friends aren't being very good friends. Alia's to the point where she just wants to give up. Then we're also going to meet Zeno. Zeno is an African gray parrot. He can mimic over 60 different sounds, and he knows 127 words. In fact, he can almost carry on a conversation with you. Now the man who uh, taught Zeno all these words dies at the very first, and so Zeno sees his chance and flies out the window. He is captured, he's sold to a lady, and the lady is ready to cut off his tail because his red tail doesn't go with the, her, her fancy furniture in her living room. Well, Zeno figures out he better try to get away from this crazy lady. 
It's fate and a banana nut muffin that bring these two characters together. Can they help each other? Can they help each other survive? Find out by reading The Desperate Adventures. Do I have anybody that like dogs in here? Oh, then you're lucky because we have several dog stories on our list this year. This is a series of uh, books uh, called The Dog Diaries. Um, this is Ginger's story. Ginger is a golden retriever. And she's a beautiful dog. All of these um, diaries, um, you guys nod your head if you know what a diary is. Okay, a, a journal that's kept from the point of view of a dog. Now, for example, she uses term, dog terms, like uh, she calls people two-legged because dogs are four-legged, four right. And uh, it tells her story from the beginning. Now, she starts out in kind of a sad situation in what they call a puppy mill. Now, what a puppy mill is is that uh, people breed dogs uh, to get as many puppies as they can so they can sell them at uh, pet stores and sell them to people. It's not very good situations, especially for the mother dog. But this is how uh, Ginger starts out life. And we, talk, we hear about the different uh, people that, uh, families that she lives with. One family that she lives with has a little, a little boy who has a hammer and he's always trying to hit Ginger's tail with the hammer. Not a good situation, right? Okay. So um, it's just a, a fun read uh, told from the point of view of the dog and all the time Ginger is looking for her forever home. Get it? Yeah. Forever home. At the very back we also have information about uh, golden retrievers, about puppy mills, about being a good pet owner. So you might find this interesting too. So uh, it's a fun book from the point of view of a dog. Our next book is called Looking for Luca. And you think, why would I want to be listening for Luca? Well, Luca is Sienna's little brother, and he hasn't spoken for a long, long time. The family decides that they're going to move out of the big city and go to a quiet little town in Maine, and probably, maybe, that might help Luca find his voice again. As Sienna's settling into her new room, she finds in the closet a pen, an old-fashioned pen, and it has somebody's initials on it. She goes, oh, this is cool, and she starts writing in her notebook. But it's not her words that come out of the pen. It's another girl by the name of Sarah. And all of a sudden, we're hearing another story. So this is a story that takes place now, and also Sarah's story that takes place during World War II in the 1940s. So we've got two stories going on. Now the thing about it is, is that Sarah has quit talking too, back in the 1940s. So is there anything that, that Sienna can do in the present time that's going to help Sarah back in the 1940s? It's kind of a fun read in L listening for Luca. Now I found that several times one book kind of went along with the next book on the list, and this is definitely the case in the, word, in the story about Duke. It's another dog story, and it's another story set during World War II. Now, um, in the book you're going to meet Hobie Hansen, and he is the owner of, of Duke. Now the author said the reason that she wrote this story is that kids, uh, the story about what kids were during World War II, you can't find very many books about it, so she wanted to tell what was happening here in the United States during World War II to kids your age. Now there was something called Dogs for Defense. And it was a program where the, the War Department said, we would like you to donate your pet dogs to the war effort so that they can uh, protect uh, places like munition plants, airplane plants, sniff out bombs, protect the soldiers, and it was called Dogs for Defense. We would find it very hard to do right now. But back in 1940s, Hobie has a little different idea. 
His dad is fighting during World War II. He's flying airplanes, fighter planes over Germany. And he thinks, maybe if I donate my dog, Duke, to do Dogs for Defense, that might get dad home safe to me and sooner. Um, but then after he, and he does donate Duke, but after he does it, he regrets his decision. Why did I do that? And he starts writing to the marine handler who is taking care of Duke and tries to drop subtle hints that, hey, can I have my dog back? Okay, I usually don't take the time to share this, but there are too many connections with this book that I need to share with you that are really, really cool. During the, sum, uh, the summer, my husband and I went on a, a little vacation and we went to north central Iowa. And I didn't know this, but during World War II, they brought German prisoners of war to Iowa to put them in prison here in Iowa. And there's a town called Algona that has a prisoner of war camp. And so my husband and I went to that, and uh, I was reading Duke at that time. And I walk into the museum, and hanging from the ceiling are some model airplanes. And I look at this, and it's the same model airplane that Hobie puts together in the book, because that's the, the plane that his dad is flying in Germany. So I go around the corner, I go into this room, and it's talking about Iowa POW camps. They had about the German POW camps. Hobie's dad gets captured by the Germans, and he gets sent to Stalag 1. And there on the wall was a map with all the different places, Stalags, prisoner of war camps in Germany. And there on the wall is a picture of people at Stalag 1, the very place where Hobie's dad is sent. That's my second connection. I go to, that, that night we went to Clear Lake, Iowa, which isn't very far from Algona, and they were having a street fair. And my husband said, I want to go downtown and, and look at the cars. And I said, I think I just want to sit here in the park. It's a beautiful night. By the lake, I want to just sit and read a book. Well, this lady comes over and she says, may I share your picnic table with you? And I said, of course, yes. And she looked at my book and she saw Duke's picture on the front. She says, what are you reading? And so I told her about the prisoner of war and I told her the cool connections that I had. And I said, you know, nobody that I've talked to has ever heard about dogs for defense. And she says, I know about this. Because her mom and her mom's sister, when they were little girls, they gave or donated their Doberman Pinscher to Dogs for Defense. And because they wanted to make sure they got their dog back, they painted his toenails red so that they made sure that they got back their dog. And they did. And sure enough, he still had his red toenails. So I asked the lady, what's your name? And she said, Gail Hansen. I said, that's the name of my kid in the story Duke, Hobie Hansen. And I heard the story about the dogs for defense from Gail Hansen. Cool connections, guys, huh? I, I, I just had to share it with you. Okay, my next one is called Half a Chance. And again, the family moves to a, a small town in New England, this time in New Hampshire. Lucy's dad is what we call a photojournalist, and he goes all over the country to take pictures of things. He's gone a lot. Lucy misses her dad a lot. And so before he leaves on his next adventure, he says, oh, by the way, I'm going to be judging a photo contest. I want you to start collecting when the packages start coming. Collect them, put them on my desk so I can see them when I get back. This is a contest for kids. It's a scavenger hunt. And here's a list of things that they're going to be looking for on this scavenger hunt. They want, uh, the scavenger hunt was, they were given a list of titles or captions. And the contest was, take a picture that illustrates this caption. And then dad takes off. Lucy starts looking at the list and thinks, I think I could do this. And so she secretly decides she's going to enter the contest. She has some help with the kids uh, uh, next door. And now, is she doing it? I mean, she's a good photographer, too. Is she doing this to prove something to herself, or is she doing this to get her dad's attention? She has half a chance of winning this contest. 
Oh, I got another dog book here for you. White, white fur flying. Zoe's family uh, loves dogs, and the kind that they like the most are called the Great Pyrenees. And they rescue dogs, uh, Great Pyrenees, from shelters. They fix them up, help them, so that they can get adopted into a forever home. About this time, a man, a woman, and a little boy move in across the street. Philip, the little boy, is another one of these characters that doesn't talk for whatever reason. But Philip is very uh, interested in all the dogs at Zoe's house. One night, Philip is looking out and he sees Jack, one of the younger dogs, take off. And Philip decides he better go look for Jack. So in the morning, both Philip and Jack are gone. And wouldn't you know, it's one of these nasty days with lots of rain and wind. And Zoe and her mom have to go looking for Philip and Jack. And what they find will really surprise you with all the white fur flying. Charlie Collier is another one of our books. It's the beginning of a series. Charlie is uh, somebody who wants to um, be a detective. He's very good at, at uh, solving puzzles, brain teasers, and people ask him all the time to help them out with uh, little puzzles and stuff. But he really, really would like a major case that he can solve. He has a sidekick named Henry who's his best friend. That's about the only friend he has. And so he's really surprised when one day the most popular girl at school, Scarlett, comes to him and says, Charlie, I need your help. My, my pet uh, parrot is missing, Socrates. You've got to help me find it. And as they start doing some research, they find not only is Scarlett's bird missing, but birds from the zoo, birds from uh, wildlife preserves are missing. Where could they be going? Finally, a major case that Charlie can solve. And he gets some help along the way from some very unusual sources, like the old man that volunteers at the library and his grandma. You won't believe what grandma did before in her life and how she can help Charlie and Henry in the homemade stuffing paper. Before I talk to you about the next book, Capture the Flag, I need to give you a little bit of information. Would you nod your head if you have ever sung our national anthem, The Star Spangled Banner? Okay, here's the story, just a reminder about um, how that song got written. Back during the War of 1812, uh, the British were bombing uh, Fort McHenry. Francis Scott Key, the man who wrote the national anthem, is out in the harbor, Baltimore Harbor, and he's watching this fight. And all night long, he wonders what's going to happen when, they can, when the sun comes up. And just like the song says, by the dawn's early light, we saw that our flag was still there. Now, the cool thing about this is that you can see that actual flag that was flying over Fort McHenry in the 1800s if you go to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. And so with that in mind, this is where our story starts at the Smithsonian. You're going to meet Anna, Jose, and Henry, and the kids are all there at a party with their mom and dad. But they don't really get to know each other. They don't really meet. The next night, they're all going to fly home, and they're at the Washington, D.C. airport and there's a blizzard, so they're snowed in. No planes coming in, no planes going out. And then it comes across the TVs. The national treasure, the star-spangled banner flag has been stolen. Who would do such a terrible thing? Everyone is so upset that this could possibly happen. Well, Anna figures out that the flag must be at the airport, and it's not going anyplace either. So they have until the end of the blizzard to figure it out before it escapes and it takes off and they'll never see it again. They meet a young boy by the name of Sinan, whose uh, family is from a different country, and he doesn't speak English too well. And because they're foreigners, they're trying to blame the flag's disappearance on Sinan's family. Now, like I said, he doesn't understand English too well, and we have funny ways 
of expressing ourselves. And Sana thinks it's hilarious, so he draws pictures in his notebook. And he has a picture of his dog being full of beans. Uh, let the cat out of the bag. I'm not made of money. I'm at the end of my rope. Now these are what we call figurative language or idioms, and I know we've done um, lessons where it's just a fun thing to do. It's a fun way of saying something, but it doesn't really mean what, what uh, is shown in the picture. But it's a fun lesson. Well, um, the kids do get help from the Silver Jaguars, another secret society. And um, their idea here is they want to capture the flag before it disappears out of the airport. Now, the fun thing is there's another book that the author has written. And how many of you have ever played the game Capture the Flag? Okay, it is a fun game. And the next book is called Hide and Seek. So the author is using the names of games for the titles of her books. This Do I have to? Yes. Uh, not that it's never, I saw that flag last year at, at the Smithsonian. So I'm telling the truth then. Yeah, it's incredible. Cool. Yeah. It is, and it's a treasure, isn't it? It sure is. It's definitely a treasure. Do I have any horse lovers in here? Yeah, cut a couple? Okay, well you would have a connection with Libby. Libby loves horses. She draws horses. She reads about horses. She dreams about horses. And you can imagine how excited she is when she finds a farm, a horse farm, called the High Hopes Horse Farm. Now it's kind of run down and the guy who owns it limps and he's kind of grumpy. But Libby comes up with a great idea. Maybe she can get this guy to give her horseback riding lessons. And here's the picture where she goes to talk to him. Now I want you to notice her sister's there in the background. And Libby, you know, gone to mom and dad, can I take horseback riding lessons? They're talking to Sal, the owner. And then Laurel thinks, I think I'd like to take horseback riding lessons. And mom and dad say yes to Laurel. But I think Libby's too young for it. Are you kidding me? And then her ex-best friend, Brittany, Brittany gets to take horseback riding lessons. Life is not fair. But how Libby chooses to deal with this situation, how she lives up to her potential, as her teacher has suggested, is uh, the story, and you'll be cheering for Libby, and I'll tell you, she's the kind of girl that you'd like for a friend. I think you'd also like Rebel McKenzie. Rebel thinks that she'd like to spend her, her summer at the Ice Age, Ice Age Kids Dig and Safari. This is a camp where kids actually get to dig for dinosaur bones. The only problem is she doesn't have any money. Well, that's okay, according to her, her big sister, her older sister, who's moved back to town. She says, uh, Rebel, I need you to come and live with me because I've got to go back to school. I need you to, to watch your nephew, Rudy. Okay, she doesn't have any money anyway. So she goes and moves in with her sister, but uh, the good news is she meets a new friend, Lacey Jane. And then there's Bambi, who lives across the street. And Bambi's one of these beauty queens that she always has her hair down and she wears fancy, fancy dresses. And she brags, do you know that I won $500 in a beauty contest because I can play the ukulele behind my head? What? Well, Rebel decides she's going to enter the beauty contest so she can win $500 so she can go to the camp. But she finds out being in a beauty contest is a little bit more than she expects. And that summer, she uh, learns something uh, about herself that will surprise everyone, including you. Now, just like Rebel had to go and leave home to help take care of someone, this is the situation in my next book called May Be. Again, it's a historical fiction, and the setting is important. The, uh, this takes place back in the 1800s in Kansas, on the prairie. Now you guys, back in those days, um, okay, we can look out the window right here and we can see t timber. And that's what people around here built their cabins from, from wood. But out in Kansas, they did not have all this extra wood. So what they would do is they would cut 
big blocks of sod or dirt and make those into bricks. And they made houses that way and they called them sodies. And that's where May is living. Now May's uh, real name is Mavis Elizabeth Betterly. But everybody just calls her May or May B. Neighbor comes over and talks to Pa. I need somebody who can, uh, May, I need her to come and live with me and help my, my new wife. She's not living, used to living out here on the prairie. She's not adjusting real well. And I think if she had some help, I think this would uh, definitely help us out. I'll pay you for it. Pa says, okay. And May's saying, wait a minute, I'm not going. I'm only 12. Dad says, May, go. You're going to help out the neighbor. I promise. I'll come and get you before Christmas. I promise. Well, with several tragic twists of events, May finds herself alone in the Saudi on the Kansas prairie. She ha it's become a story of survival. And she's got to find food, she's got to find fuel, and then the worst thing happens. There's a blizzard, and she literally is snowed in. Now, May's story is told in what we call free verse. This would be a very quick read for kids your age. Because look, there's not very many words on each page, are there? Yeah. But it's called free verse, which is poems that don't rhyme. But if you're going to find out a little bit about survival, is um, May going to make it? Maybe she will, and maybe she won't. This is the book that a lot of people are interested in. It's called The Blood Guard. Now, Ronan thinks he has a very uh, regular life. Yeah, his mom keeps him busy after school. She has him in swimming and gymnastics and fencing lessons. And we find out that she's been preparing him for a day like today. So mom picks him up after school. And instead of taking him to practice, she starts driving away like a crazy woman. Mom, what's going on? And she turns to him and says, Ronan, i got to tell you something. I'm part of a group called the Blood Guard, and it's a secret society that pledges to take care of 36 pure souls who keep the world on an even keel. Now, your dad has been kidnapped. What? And there's people in SUVs, red SUVs behind us, that are probably trying to kill you. What? I'm going to get you to the train station. I want you to go to Washington, D.C. There'll be somebody there contact person that's going to keep you safe. What? Well, through a series of adventures, Rowan does get on the train. He hooks up with Dawkins, um, who is his contact person. And um, unfortunately, also on the train is somebody from his old school, Greta. They don't get along too well. But Greta just happens to be there when the bad guys show up. And there's nothing they can do except take Greta along with them as they jump off the train. This becomes a series of adventures. And I'll tell you guys, it was what I just kept having to turn the page. Just when I thought that they were safe, I turned the page. Another terrible thing was going to happen to them. Oh, it's uh, everything that they can do to save the world from what a group called the Ben Sinister who wants to destroy everything. So it is a series at the end of the book. It's just the beginning of the next book. So this is called The Blood Guard. My last two books are kind of connected in that they both have to do with racial injustice and both have to do with things that happened a uh, long time ago. Another historical fiction book. We have, uh, this happens in 1935 in uh, Bismarck, North Dakota. The real person is called Satchel Page, and he is this baseball player, probably the best baseball player that there ever was. He, is, he really did play in North Dakota on a semi-pro team in 1935, and that's where we meet Nick. Nick has something called polio. You guys don't ever have to worry about it because when you were a baby, you got a shot. But Nick was living in a time when there wasn't a, a vaccination. He gets polio, which paralyzes your um, muscles. And Nick now has to wear um, a brace, which is really a bummer because he loves playing baseball. And he can't play with uh, wearing a brace. 
His dad is part of a um, the semi-pro team, and so Nick gets to hang around with these baseball players. And the things that Satchel Paige teaches him are some wonderful life lessons on how to deal with having uh, physical problems. And as I said, um, the problem is it's 1935, and Satchel Paige is black, and he cannot play on a pro team with white players. When they go on the road, they can't stay in the same hotel as white players. So it's not really fair, some of the things that Satchel Paige had to deal with, but his life lessons are timeless. My last book is called Kizzy Ann's Dance, and again, it's about a little girl who is black. This year now is 1963. Kizzy Ann is going to be one of the first white children going to a um, all-white school in Lynchburg, Virginia. Her black teacher has said, uh, you need to white, write a letter to your new teacher so that she needs, she knows about you. And in fact, the whole book is a series of letters that uh, Kizzy Ann writes to her teacher. And it kind of bro it broke my heart, some of the things, the injustices, the bad things that happened to her just because of the color of her skin. Now, one thing that uh, helps her get through all the problems is her dog Shag here. And Shag is, going, is uh, eligible to go in a competition for herding um, animals. He's a border collie, and he is the best, smartest dog ever. But there's a chance that they won't get to compete because of the color of Kizzy Ann's skin. Is it fair? No. And I'm so glad that things are different now. But I think you'll enjoy reading about Kizzy Ann's stance. Okay, take a look at your list. Did you find a book that you just can't wait to read? Yes. Okay, raise your hand if you found at least one. Okay, hands down. How many of you think that you're going to make it a goal this year to read two books so that you can vote in March? Okay, Mr. Haller, look at all these kids that are going to be reading here for you. So I want to thank you all for being such good listeners. How you can thank me is to read, read, read.